I want to ask it's kind of the the core question of, of each of these episodes about you know what's keeping you up at night and you know we've been talking for the last you know 15 minutes or so about a variety of things that in theory could be keeping you up and, and stressing you out but you strike me as a person who is very excited about the various opportunities and like you have a gen like the little bit we've got in the chat like a genuine curiosity and excitement about all of this but that being said you are wearing as i said many many hats not just the expos one so what is the thing that is stressing you out most about your job and kind of quote unquote keeping you up at night yeah. okay there's going to be i'm going to give you two answers and one is going to be the higher level more philosophical answer that's keeping me up at night and then the other one will be the more tactical like day to day what's actually like stressing me out i think the thing that is keeping me up at night the most is in is a really reflective of the sales profession as a whole because I think, Adam, to what we were talking about before when we said it is important to slow down and take the time to meet with people and take the time to network and build that out and build out. I was talking to a colleague about building a community and right. And, and you know, you're you're doing things today that will hopefully accelerate the future of what you're trying to do. The problem is most people aren't patient enough for that. Most organizations and oftentimes leadership are most certainly not patient enough for that. So a lot of times salespeople, myself included, I've done it a million times over, fall back into that. I don't have time to slow down and have the right conversations and do the right thing. So I'm just going to do more of the wrong things. I'm just going to do more mass email and I'm going to do more parallel dialing 17 people at a time to blow through lists of a thousand people in a day. Like I'm going to do more of that, which is more of the wrong thing, which is more perpetuating the stereotype of salespeople being underprepared, just trying to sell their stuff. Don't care about the prospect. Don't care about solving problems. Don't care about building relationships. That is my biggest thing from a high level philosophical perspective that scares me about sales because we're going down that path or back down that path. Yeah, I want to talk about that before we get to your, your tactical one, because I have a, we've been kicking around a, a theory on our marketing team around that exact thing, because we uh, we are running, we're just now getting the data for our 2024 state of sales development report, which is our 2023 one was the first year we did it. And it was very successful. People loved the data we had in there. And we were really interested because 2024 has been you now everyone's always like this year has been so different than everything else, but like legitimately 2024 with, you know, the the whole AIification of everything and people panicking. Like I was, really, we were interested to see what was going on. And what we're seeing is there's all this data that shows that sales development representatives are actually creating less pipeline than they ever have before. In fact, it's not even like the majority, like AEs and CSM and all these other teams are creating more pipeline than STRs are right now. But at the same time, every organization, like the thousand organizations we blind surveyed, we're like, well, we're planning on hiring a bunch more SDRs in the next 12 months. And it's just like, it, we ask, they're just throwing money and we asked them what their top three uh, tools are. And they said the phone, which is great. They said, e they said uh, social, which makes sense. And they said email. And they're just like, it's exactly what you said. It's like, they're just throwing money at the problem, trying to figure it out. And I, the re my theory, it's a very long preamble to this is, because sales is so quota based and it's, it's not only is it like, what have you done for me lately? The moment the quarter ends or the half ends or the year ends, it's no longer, what have you done for me lately? It's like, what are you doing for me right now? What are you, what's your number right now? And every single, you know, person is beholden to a certain number. And if they don't hit that number, a lot of places are so impatient that they just will kick you to the curb. I think a lot of it has to do with like, people are so in sales are very afraid to try new things because what if it doesn't work is a thing that you can't really say in sales in marketing especially at a startup we are fortunate to be able to say what if it doesn't work especially if the cost is zero um so our theory is just like people are afraid to change because they don't want to know what happens if it doesn't work so they just keep throwing money at it like they always have so i'll say something that I don't know where your audience falls in the way of seniority and, and level in an organization but i think a lot of it and I've had this conversation with former leaders of mine. I think in a lot of spots, it's exactly what you said. This is what we, we know how this works. We hire SDRs, they produce X. We hire twice the SDRs, they produce two X. Sales isn't math. That's not how that actually works. And the thing is, 
from a leadership perspective, that's what they did, or that's what they've seen, or that's what's worked for them in the past. So they're doing the same thing where everybody's just protecting themselves. Well, we needed more pipeline. I hired more people. We did more marketing campaigns. We did whatever it is that traditionally would produce that. And then that trickles downward as an SDR. I'm not producing enough meetings. What do I do? I make more phone calls. I send more emails. And when I'm talking to my leadership, they go, well, that's what you got to do, right? That's what you do when you're struggling. You make more calls. You send more emails. So everybody's just so happy protecting themselves with the status quo from bottom to top that nobody wants to take that risk and go, hey, I tried something and it didn't work. Or if you do, it has to be so small and so minimally impactful that even if it does work, you could barely tell. I did something. I got an extra meeting. Cool. Is that worth it? Well, who knows? And then if you, like from a marketing standpoint, like you said, like, if it if you have a play to do, like, we're going to focus on our SEO content or we're going to build a state of sales development report. I have the luxury this year of building out the state of sales development report by being able to show the ROI of last year's. I didn't have that last year. It was a big bet. And salespeople, you can't say, ask me in six months if the thing I'm doing today worked. So I, I, I like I said, I, I really do think it's that this has always worked. We don't know what's going to happen moving forward. And that's scary to us all. And I think we're in agreement there. That's the big philosophical one that we can't fix. Let's hear the thing that keeps you up at night that, that is tactical that you think we can fix. I think it's the fallout from that first thing that causes me issues in my day to day. So people send more emails. Google goes, uh-uh, you can't do that anymore, right? And so now we have the same issue where it's like, well, I can take the time and I can write a really nicely well-crafted email and then I press send and then I get a notification being like, you can't send email to this person. You're like, son of a B, this sucks. And so again, it, it makes my job more difficult because when we're selling our services to anybody, now it's not just like, hey, we'll, we'll go and we'll, and like Unicorn's awesome, we offer everything from RevOps as a service right up to like, we can get you SDRs or closers, whatever. That's cool. But now it's not just we do that. It's like, okay, also you need, you need to buy like 14 other domains and like two emails at each. And it's going to cost you not, not a lot. Domains are cheap. That's fine. But like, I need to explain to you why. And then they go, I don't, I don't understand that. That's not a thing I've ever seen. Let's just do it the way we've been doing it. It's fine. You're like, it's not fine. But also do I like, where, where does the line draw where you're like, I have to turn down business because this doesn't make sense anymore. Or I'm afraid of negatively impacting what you're doing or your domain or all that stuff. So like, how do we set it up so that we can give our clients the best opportunity to succeed and have them feel really good about that when they're talking to us? So there's like so much more education that goes into it now. And even then you're still kind of rolling the dice going like, I, I hope you understand where I'm coming from and why I want to do this. And it's not because I want to take your money. It's because I want this to make sense for everybody. Yeah. So what are the ways that you're working to convince people? I, 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 can I just send out an open ask on this podcast for people to reach out to me and tell me how to do it? Um, they're like the, the biggest, the biggest challenge becomes, and again, in the world I'm living in where we're talking to a lot of founders who, again, a lot of times have been very successful with their founder led sales and made, those moves, but it's how do you then scale? And so it's explaining to them that like, you did this really awesome thing in this really small spot of people who sort of know you got referred to you, connected with you. You didn't have to worry about cold calling all that much. You didn't have to worry about cold email. You didn't have to worry about volume. And now we want to scale that. But the problem is the niche that you found yourself in isn't necessarily representative of what the rest of the market will be for your product, right? Your niche is people who know you, their industry isn't necessarily as relevant as it would be otherwise. The size of their company isn't necessarily as relevant. Like, I'll take a shot on you because I know you, but typically I would never do this based on the size of my company, the industry, revenue numbers, whatever. So it's like, how do we paint the picture of you've done something great, but also we're going to ignore that for a second because we have to do all of this. So it's really comes down to teaching like, hey, here's, here's the game plan. And like Unicorn's only been around for seven-ish months. So like we don't even have it fully formulated to say that this is exactly what we're going to do. Plus it depends, different industries, different products, all that kind of stuff. So 
For us, it really comes down to like, let me give you a play-by-play -play of what this is going to look like and why each of these steps is important. And being able to really do that versus saying like, we can help you out. Here's generally what we do. There is like night and day difference in the results as well as the patience that the founders have when we're doing that. Because if you don't break it down for folks and you're telling them we're charging you X amount of dollars and like two weeks in, they don't have a meeting. They're like, guys, what's going on here? Like I'm spending all this money and you're getting me nothing. Okay. But if you explain to them properly and they fully understand, well, week one, like we're just setting stuff up. We're not even doing anything. Week two, we're going to start testing and then we're going to iterate. And this is what it's typically going to look like. And this is what the goal is. This is what a good reply rate looks like. This is what a good connect rate looks like. This is what a good conversion rate looks like. Once they're in the funnel, same thing, each step. So like, there's so much iteration occurring that you're like, yeah, the reply rates of our first emails, it's going to suck. Like it just, it is, we don't know what works yet, but we're going to take what does work. We're going to A to Z test it. And then we're going to get better. So like, it really just comes down to breaking things down. Um, and the thing, last thing I'll, I'll say about this, and like, I hope I don't offend any founders who listen to this, but um, founders are very, very smart and very, very good at what they do. But the majority of the ones we deal with, that thing that they do isn't sales. And so it's not always easy to have them take a step back and be like, hey, I'm I'm a dummy in this segment, but I'm brilliant over here. And like being able to separate those two is sometimes challenging because they think they're like, hey, I'm good at this, which means I'm good at all of it. Yeah. As you were talking, like the the phrase that just jumped out of my mind is like trust is iterative as well. Like we're really like your Orem. Our founder was a is a salesperson was like headed up the sales development at rubric like so he knows that like okay if i'm going to scale this i need other sales people i need product people like i can't do all this myself but like you're right when there's other founders when a founder comes on board and like they code a platform themselves they start doing founder-led sales for several months they get their initial amount of money it they're like white knuckling that thing so like their grip is so tight that you like trust is iterative you have to like slowly release like one finger off at a time and be like we're gonna sh like exactly what you said like we're gonna show you in week one what is starting to work now and how we're going to you know to keep working like you know i think as people get further and further along in the journey that's why customer stories are so impactful that's why network Based selling is becoming more and more impactful because you can build that initial trust. And then like once you have that initial step where it's like, hey, Chris trusts what I what we've done so far for them. That's why we wanted to reach out to you. And they're like, okay, I'll give you a I'll give you a shot. And then you at least have that moment. So I yeah, I it's a thing we're all feeling and we're all experiencing is that like, how do we get people to trust us when they're afraid of change because sales is hard? <laughs> totally. And like the, the way you said that is so perfect because that's why you have to like really break things down. And it's not because, again, like so many of the founders we deal with are, are brilliant. And it's not because they're not. It's because you want to be able to build that trust. And if I say, look, week one, we're going to start sending out emails. We're literally going to accomplish nothing. Like I'm telling you, we're not going to get a reply in week one. It's just how it is. Like this is how this is going to work. But then you don't get that reply week one and they're not phased because they're like, oh, well, Chris told me it's going to be like this. And the goal is by week two, like, hey, that's when we're going to start getting our first meetings. And then we're going to ramp up by the end of the month that month two is going to look like this. And when we can start breaking that down and then to your point, you're just, you're building trust every week. Like, oh yeah, okay, nothing's happening, but they told me that. Oh, okay, the next week, hey, we're starting to get something. Okay, cool. Now we're building that trust. And I think to your point, if you're selling through your network, if you're reaching out to people, like, you're starting with just a little bit more trust than you would have had otherwise. And if you're cold calling, you're starting from like negative trust because they're just already pissed off. You're calling them, bugging them, right? So like, how do you build up a little bit of trust in that first couple of seconds? And it is through being properly prepared and knowing what you're going to say and having it be relevant to them. And again, to kind of go back to that first thing, the more people make BS cold calls, send junky emails, the worse you are hurting the reputation of the entire sales world and you're putting everybody a step back. So that is my, my rant about the state of sales. <laughs>